Jesus. I can see clearly. The hand of God is currently upon someone in this congregation. There is a quick deliverance. There is a quick deliverance that the Lord wants to perform on the life of that individual. He's taking something away from your life. And his hand, oh my, his hand is intense, it's intense to effect that which I see in the spirit. His hand is intense. I can already see that it is a lady. That lady, the hand of God is upon you. I ask that you remove that which you need to remove from her life. So that you can set her upon her feet to engage destiny. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. I think we need to specially salute this choir. Specially. <laughs> it's a great moment in the presence of God and it is in moments like that that we secure answers you know when you are praying on your own you may not pick so much but when you come into an atmosphere that is enabled you can secure answers the Lord will give you answers in the name of Jesus. Please, you may take your seat. God bless you. Yesterday, we were taking inventory of a few things that we cannot neglect if what we want to practice is accurate priesthood. There is a great emphasis on how the offerer of sacrifices must adorn himself. And the issue of your life of consecration, the issue of your walk of holiness is critical. Hallelujah. Before we go into how to offer things and all of that, it is needful for us to clear the table on these matters. So we stopped yesterday at the bond offering. It is because Jesus offered himself as a bond offering that we are enjoined to consecrate ourselves to serve his will. I think a more graphic picture about uh, that matter is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Isaiah, chapter 53. Are you there in Isaiah chapter 53? Amen. Isaiah 53 verse 7 and verse... Yeah, verse 7. He was oppressed and, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And that's a bond offering. He would have protested. But that, that was not how Jesus did it. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her sharers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. So it was a complete sacrifice. There was no revolt. There was no protest whatsoever. And it is because of the quality of sacrifice that Jesus offered to secure our redemption that it could only be reasonable if we reciprocate this 
gesture of love with an act of complete committal to God. Now, I, I need to take you on a trip quickly. We are trying to consolidate the issues that we ra raised yesterday. If you are in the book of Genesis, chapter 12, when Abraham decided to respond to the call of God, um, his actual act of obedience is what is captured in the book of Genesis, chapter 12, from verse 6 and verse 7. Before we read Genesis chapter 12, verse 6, I need to tell you about my experience in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, uh, the United Kingdom is a very organized place. Not necessarily a beautiful place, but an organized place. I've been to some places in Europe that is far more beautiful than the United Kingdom. But the United Kingdom is very organized. And what I mean by that is that every house has an identity. Every location has an identity that has been adequately cataloged. So if we want to come to your house, for instance, we don't need to know the directions to your house. All we need is the postcode to your house. The postcode is the postal architecture system as it affects your own specific location. And that is, it is mapped like that across the entire nation. So once you put the postcode into your Google map, Google map will take you directly to the location. And so part of the competencies you must exhibit in order for you to qualify for a driver's license in the United Kingdom is to be able to interpret a Google map. Because once you can interpret that Google map with the postcode of the location that you want to go, you can drive your way guided by that map to that location. So what we have in the book of Genesis chapter 12 verse 6 is a Google map. Google map of Abraham's navigation from where he was to where God wanted him to be. Google map of the turns, the twists that he had to embark upon in order for him to arrive at the place of destiny. And each point in the journey of Abraham is critical, is strategic. And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. So if you want to understand the lessons that are attached to the navigation of Abraham, you will need to take your lexicon and find out the meaning of Sikkim. Because that's where God led him. You need to find out the meaning of More. Meanwhile, Sikkim means the shoulder. That's the place you, you bear your bodies. If you go to the Middle East, you find people, they don't, they don't carry load on their head the way we do here. They take it on the shoulder. So the shoulder is a significant place to bear burdens. And part of the ways that God will manipulate your life is that he will allow you to be overwhelmed by certain burdens, certain burdens. Especially if the burden overwhelms your wisdom, overwhelms your capacity, overwhelms your technical know-how, it is likely that in the face of that burden, you will cry to God. Now, the, uh, the average man is not likely to cry to God. In fact, he likes life to be in a formula, in a set of formulas, so that he doesn't need to seek God out to get wisdom on how to navigate. So it's just a set of formulas, and he comes and presses buttons. He comes and uses keys. <laughs> God uh, <laughs> has not made life that orderly. You will need to seek out every instance of your destiny. And a man that is not ready to get stuck in the act of priesthood is going to lose his way many times because his natural wisdom is going to fail him. So God allows some burdens that will stretch you to come upon your life. And it's not because God hates you. It's because he wants you to lose confidence in your human wisdom. He wants you to lose confidence in your natural ability 
so that you can trust him to order your affairs. So he will take you through seeking. Seeking. Then more means an archer, someone that is about to shoot an arrow. And the dynamics of an arrow is that it must be adequately focused on the target. The arrow would have achieved the purpose for which it was manufactured. And you need to know what and what must be in place in order for you to manufacture an arrow. It's a lot of effort. The process of manufacturing an arrow, which is ex exceedingly tedious, is going to be justified if the arrow fulfills the purpose for which it was manufactured. And the thing about an arrow is that it's a precision instrument. And God is saying that your life is a precision instrument. Part of the things, are you here? Yes, sir. You're not here. Part of the things God will do for you, the moment he comes into talking terms with you, is that he will show you how displaced you are from his ordination for your life. Like I told you the other day, I wanted to be a lecturer. I wanted to be a lecturer. And part of the reason why I wanted to be a lecturer was because I wanted to cram the notes and come to class and give notes without a, a guide. You see the canal? <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, so that's what I wanted to be. Um, I, in, in terms of comprehension, uh, if I read, I can comprehend. So I felt, okay, this gift I have, the, the way to maximize it is to be in an ivory tower where that deals in capacity building. I've seen that. So I felt, okay, let me go into that space and I'll be able to maximize my potential. Uh, you see, the best of us is going to choose the wrong options except we are encountered by God. So part of what God does when he catches your attention by giving you a burden that you cannot handle, is that he wants to redirect you. The dealings of God will redirect you. So part of what God did to me is that he told me that there is no script in heaven that captures any information that I was going to lecture. So what he's trying to do is that as he puts the burden upon you, then he now focuses your life on target so that you will not miss your way. Are, are you still with me? I remember an experience that I had. I and a friend of mine, we were prayer partners and we were trying to find the purpose of God, the will of God for our lives. So after church prayer and fasting like this, when the service comes to an end, we'll go somewhere and continue our own personal prayer. Are you there? So, we we'll speak in tongues, we we'll pray for another three hours in addition to the prayers that take place in church. And one of those days while we were praying in the prayer closet, we had a problem with the power. The power distribution company decided to withdraw their service. And his house was rigged with many phases. So when they withdrew their service on one line, he went and to the garage to engage another phase where there was electricity. From the time he left the prayer room, going to the garage to change the line of electricity that was in use, an angel of the Lord appeared to me and gave me direction. And that was why I was praying, gave me direction how that I need to go back to Kano where I did my youth service, that I just finished youth service, I've not finished God, God's assignment. That was where I discovered that um, your work is different from your job. Your work pays you rewards, your job pays your salaries. So you have finished your youth service, but you have not finished your assignment. So I got all those directions. And in the face of the insecurity in the city of Kano at the time, I went back to Kano. 
What we are doing as a ministry today, I saw it in Kano, what we are doing. I had multiple encounters from God. I wrote down on, on a script. We typed it out and made a brochure out of it. We distributed the brochure so that the people that were present will understand what God has called us to do. Then we lost touch with any of those documents, the brochure. It was Pastor Dan that brought an e-copy. I don't know where he got it. It was snapped. A snapped copy of the brochure and sent it to me. And when I read through what God said, we're already doing everything he said that time. It's now a reality now. Are you there? But well, you remember I told you I had a prayer partner. When I encountered the angel, I told him, I have received direction, I'm going. He also left. It was 10 years later that I discovered he did not receive direction. May you... Re- <laughs> don't go, don't go because others are gone. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. 10 years later, there was no direction. There was still confusion. You see, you would think you are actually going in the right direction. It is God that will focus your arrow on target. If God has not given you direction yet, even when we finish the 40 days fasting, don't stop fasting. Are you there? So he gave direction. It is that divine direction that God gave that is responsible for what we are doing today. Next verse is my verse of interest, verse 7. Now he has come into the land. And Abraham, and the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Do you realize that at this time, Abraham did not even know the name of the God that was speaking to him? God had not given him a formal introduction of himself. But he had received encounters from God, sufficient encounters to know that an interaction has been taking place. He's a victim of the interaction already because he's obeying the voice of the spirit that is speaking to him. Now, he has come into the land that the spirit led him to come to, then the spirit appeared to him to, to make him know that, hey, that contract for which I displaced you from your household is still fully in force. Are you there? They immediately he had that encounter. The next thing he did was that he raised an altar unto the Lord that appeared unto him. There were many spirits in the jungle, but the one unto whom he raised an altar was the one that appeared unto him. Now, can we try to analyze the significance of this altar before we continue on our journey. Meanwhile, this is an additional attempt to bring you back from the market. I know some of you are still in the market. Your soul is in the market. Where you lost your purse, your ID card is misplaced, your heart. So this scripture now is an attempt to bring you back. It's not part of the lecture. I'm just trying to collect you back from where your soul is in the name of Jesus. Can we analyze that altar? Because with that altar, Abraham was saying, I agree. I want to be what you have said. I offer myself completely to become a vessel that will live out the destiny that you have revealed to me. Meanwhile, he doesn't know the name of the Lord that appeared to him. But he had raised an altar of consecration. Are you there? So this is an altar of consecration. It's an altar of total committal to God. This is the proof that you are reasonable. This is the proof that you, you mean business. It means that if you don't get to as much as raise this altar of consecration, you don't mean business. God should not take you seriously. You are still unreasonable. He needs to give you time. Your, your arrow of destiny has not yet focused on the target, so you still have many other options to spend your life upon. For Abraham, that was not the case. 
An altar of com complete committal unto God was what he raised in response to the attempts that God was making to catch his attention. Are you? Hmm? Ah, for your information, this is the broker I'm telling you, I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't know where Pastor, Pastor Dan, where did you get this thing from? Meanwhile, you are seeing how rugged this one is. It's as if it's in the spirit realm. For your information, that was our first logo. When we were still trying to understand this thing that, <laughs> see what? <laughs> that was our first logo. We were still trying to understand it. Don't, don't laugh. Don't laugh. We were trying to interpret what the Spirit said. And uh, this is the best we could do at the time. It took, it took obedience. When we began to obey, then the understanding began to increase. That's when we were able to evolve our current logo. I hope you know the meaning of our current logo. It's drawn from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 18 to 20. It said, where two or three are gathered in my name. That fire is the presence of God. That if we are able to satisfy the quorum, the intercessory quorum for territorial help, the flame of God is going to come on our territory. If we are able to satisfy the intercessory quorum for, in, for, for national intervention, the fire of God will come upon our nation. If we are able to fulfill the quorum for continental visitation, the fire of God will come upon the continent. So that's when we understood better, we replaced that. So two or three. So this is the upper limit that Jesus made available in the book of Matthew chapter 18. And that fire there is the fire of the presence of God that comes to attend to our priesthood as we align to make, create earthly permission for heavenly interference. So we migrated from, where's that logo? <laughs> well, I think you understand me. So that's what it means when God begins to focus your arrow. Now, if you start out, don't be afraid to make a mistake. Just start. Just go in the direction of God's leading. As you begin to go, you understand more and God is going to be focusing your destiny on point. Okay, so when you see the list, uh, the first was remnant fellowship, which is what we are doing now. Then we now have remnant end time online, online ministry. You know, Hey, let me leave that. Let me leave that. Uh, today, Pastor B is the online pastor. By the time we wrote this thing, okay, I hope you know what I'm talking about. Then we have Remnant TV. See, and God has given us. And then we have Remnant Apostolic Invasion, which is conferences and crusades, and we have started that now. See the logo that time. We're still trying to <laughs> All right, so as you obey God, as you walk with God, then you become, clarity comes to you, clarity. God is focusing you, showing you what you were designed to achieve, to obtain, the path that you were designed to run upon, to spend your life to achieve and to apprehend that which God is offering you. I hope that makes sense. And the way Abraham responded to all of that was that he raised an altar, an altar of complete committer to serve the will of God and to achieve the promise that God had given unto him. I need to say something before I jump back into the script. Um, God's vision for you is bigger than your, the personal ambition you have for yourself now. God's vision. Please help me preach to your neighbor God's vision for you is greater than your personal ambition that you have for yourself. For your information, I never thought that I will be an international preacher, and I did not pray for it. I did not desire it. What I wanted to be was someone that could handle the word of God with integrity and raise people that Jesus can trust. That was my 
objective. That was the, the reason why I was behind the pulpit. Hallelujah. In fact, we went to Abuja uh, after my elder brother's wedding, and then a preacher came and snatched me from the wedding and said, we need to go and counsel with one of our brethren. I was confused. He said, you, you know the Bible. If we go there, open scriptures and counsel the person. So I did not even have the details of this counseling. But they forced me, we went. When we went there, we were waiting for the person that we came to counsel in his sitting room. So when he woke up, we waited for like 20 minutes. I said, someone that needs counseling should be waiting for us. We should not be the ones waiting for somebody that we are coming to give counsel. So when the person came out of a, a preacher, he came out of the room and he saw us, he began to speak in tongues. I was confused because we came to counsel. Now, uh, there's a prayer meeting. Okay. Then he shouted. Then he came to me and said, Don't say the Lord. I, I, was, I was asking myself, why, why are we here now? That you have an international ministry. I just lock, I lock my heart because God has never told me that I had an international ministry. So I was hearing him. So I said, you're planting uh, branches of your ministry in Europe. <laughs> I was satisfied being a pastor in my country. And I was not excited at the prophecy because God has not told me that I had an international ministry. Are you, do you understand what I'm talking about? He finished prophesying and saying so many things. When he finished the prophecy, I now told the person that brought me, let's, let's go, wait, let's go. Because it's obvious, no counseling. You are coming to counsel somebody, he has prophesied on you, so how do you, enga- <laughs> how do you now sit him down and say, I, I say, well done, God bless. That's how we left that place. It took another four years before I knew that I had international ministry. It was after God now spoke to me that I had international ministry. I was now trying to remember what the brother said. Hey, Europe, hey. Do you know that those things have happened? The day we flew to Belgium to set up our branch, that, that day, anointing that day was something else. So, you know, can you imagine that a ministry that starts from uh, Kodi goes around the world? Not from Abuja, not from Lagos, not from Botakot, starting from where? Doesn't make sense. But it's, that's why God needs to, he needs to align your life. So part of what he will do as it begins to labor over your spirit, is that it begins to bring you into precision. Now, are you there? Now, I have so many invitations where to preach. But 70% of the invitations, I'm not attending to them. You know why? Because I know what God wants me to do. And those invitations don't fall into the category of things that God wants me to do. Do you understand that? And this is not pride. This is not pride. Don't waste your life on things that are not directly connected to your eternal purpose. Invitations everywhere. In fact, my rule now is that if a number calls me that is not registered on my phone, it's blocked. I don't need new friends. I don't need new invitations. I don't need to visit new places. The ones God has shown me, if I can achieve it with my lifetime. <laughs> that is where I'm going. You become more focused. Opportunities for you to waste your life will come. And, and, and some of them come in form of preaching on opportunities. The more it starts becoming clear, you begin to see opportunities will be 
coming with intensity. But you can judge because God has begun to fine-tune you. How many of you have used the camera before and you are fine-tuning the lens so that the image becomes clearer? That's how God works on you. The more you work with him, the more fine-tuned you become. You will know what is in your lane and what is outside of your lane. The more you work with him, a lot of pastors want to be your friends, and there's nothing wrong with that. But as you become more precise, you will know that this kind of friendship will not, your values are different, your orientation is different, the direction you are going is different, and you want to become friends. Is that not, there's something wrong with that. You'll be able to judge the kind of people that you can relate with on the path towards the achieving of that destiny. God doesn't want you to, to expand your strength. So he begins to streamline you and he streams line, stream lines you like, like an arrow that is poised at hitting the target. Is that clear? And that's not pride. It's not pride at all. It's just that you have come to a, a better understanding of your lane. There was a time where any invitation that came I will preach. Then another time now came, he now began to define it. And I now discovered that it's not every invitation that falls into the category of what God has approved. Now it's even slimmer. There is a trademark that any minister I relate with must have. And um, it happens to be that people that have that trademark are few. So God has put me in the unpopular lane. Are you there? Smith Wigglesworth, was it the one? Or Lester Sumra. He said at the age of, if you are 40 years in ministry, if you are 60 years of age, and you have three good friends, then you are lucky. Uh, I'll leave you with that. I know it doesn't make sense to some of you now, because you are still on the Broadway. As God begins to streamline you, you will find out that some people you call your friends are the ones that expose you the most. Part of the prayers we are going to pray during the course of this fasting is that the Lord should open our eyes to see the people around us. Then you might find out that you are in a canoe that is about to sink. So God begins to align you. He begins to, you know, point you at purpose, so that you can expend your resources uh, to achieve God's will. So that's the bond offering. Abraham responded to the advances of God by raising an altar of complete committal to God, and that is what we call consecration in the New Testament. God is interested about the shape of the person that offers sacrifice to him. It must be someone that is consecrated to serve his will because that is what is going to give God a soft spot concerning you. The reason why I'm living is because I'm living to serve him. Uh, it must come from someone that is separated unto him. The meaning of the person's life is the meaning that God confers upon him. It's not the meaning that he wants to get in view of the perception of the world system or the age in which he finds himself, but his meaning derives from what God says he was called to achieve. The Bible says in him, all things consist. It means that I'm going to receive a definition of my essence from Jesus Christ. And Jesus, in dealing with me so far, has made me to understand that one of the major highlights of the service he has called me to bring to the body of Christ is to build capacity using the instrument of the infallible word of God. So most of my labors are in the word of God. If you say, are you a prayer person? I would say yes. But I'm more of a Bible man than a prayer man. That's my orientation. My wife is more of a prayer woman than she's a Bible woman. In fact, when it's time for her to preach, she'll wake me up and say, my husband, let's study this thing together. 
I'm in the Bible. And don't get it wrong. You might think that that means I don't pray. You are wrong. You are so wrong. I can pray for 18 hours with my back on my bed. So don't, don't, I know your mind is saying, okay. Ah, okay. It means I'm like you. You are not like me. <laughs> I'm not like you. If you know the things that come at me in the realm of the spirit, sometimes you'll be in prayers for three days. In those days, I don't study the Bible. I study the Bible when there's peace. When there's a war in the spirit, for you can see me for seven days, I'm speaking in tongues. But when we finish with that war, then I come back. But my wife, prayer comes to her naturally. The one she's learning is Bible study. Me, Bible study came to me naturally. The one I learn is prayer. Find out the hand that God gave you. You have one hand. Is it prayer? Then discipline yourself to study the Bible. If, like me, Bible study comes easily to you, there's something that draws you to the Bible, then go and look for the other hand because you cannot clap with one hand. Exactly. One will come to you naturally. Glory to God. Find the one that does not come naturally and develop it because you must fly on both wings. Okay, so let's move. The next is what we call the next offering that God commanded in the Old Testament, which is very significant, is what we call the peace offering. And the peace offering is significant because it is through the manifestation of this peace offering that God reveals our level of compliance in spiritual matters. Come with me. Now, peace has a wide spectrum of meanings in New Testament Christianity. So I want to show you two sides of the pole. We have the God of peace and we have the peace of God. Two sides of the pole. Uh, I think Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, will be a worthy introduction into this subject. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. There was a sacrifice that was released to secure peace. You know, I told you that our priesthood is based on Jesus' priesthood. Everything we are doing in our priestly business is based on the foundation that our high priest has created. Are you there? I say, are you there? And that's why when you go into uh, the holy place, you will find some piece of furniture. And I told you that the brazen altar it's referring to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is what even legitimizes our priesthood. Without that sacrifice, you don't even have a basis of saying you want to commune with God, you want to do business with God, you are hoping that God will give you a personal covenant. All of that is available to us because Jesus uh, paid the ultimate price and the greatest altar that is in the earth is the brazen altar, which is a cross of Jesus Christ. And I need to show you the implications, the judicial implication of the cross of Jesus uh, is a type of peace that is enshrined in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 1. Romans, chapter 5, verse 1. It reveals um, a type of peace that results from the, t the satisfaction of divine justice. The Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith. I hope you know what justification means. It means to be declared righteous. The kind of thing that happens in the court when the judge, having heard both sides of the argument and comparing and compromising the arguments with the spirit of the law, comes forth with a judgment. The judgment is, is the fruit, is the result um, of unveiling the true perspective of justice, judgment, and equity. 
So the Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith. When the blood of Jesus was brought into the court of law and my sin was put on the beam balance and the blood of Jesus was put on this other side of the beam balance, the weight of the blood of Jesus superseded the weight of my sin. So justice was pronounced in my life on the strength of the weight of the blood of Jesus. So the judge, who happens to be a righteous judge, now declares me righteous. Because of my faith in Jesus Christ, his blood makes the judgment that was hanging on my head inconsequential. Because his blood is a proof that that judgment has already been served and he was the one that took away that judgment so that I can experience the initial blessing among many other blessings that will come. That initial blessing is justification. I was declared what? Righteous. That legal statement that came from the judge is what was responsible to end my quarrel with God. So being justified by faith, the Bible says we have peace with God. That's the first line of peace. That's the one I wanted you to see. This one is judicial type. It's a judicial type of peace that has solved my quarrel with God. So I and God are no longer quarreling. Do you know how big this blessing is? It is because I and God are no longer quarreling. It is because I am declared righteous. It is because my challenge with God has been solved. Now I can come into God's presence and discuss with him because we are no longer quarreling. It is this justification that makes it possible for me to pray. Are you there? And all of these things are, are available to me through priesthood, the priesthood of Jesus. Oh, you are not following. I need to show you the priesthood of Jesus first before I begin to show you your own priesthood because your own priesthood is built on the foundation of his priesthood. See, his priesthood now has provided us justification. And because of justification, I can now go before God and stand before him to talk with him without condemnation, without inferiority, because I have been declared righteous. Do you understand that? Now, as we go into our own priesthood, you are going to see what we are going to do with this justification. Justification is going to be the reason for which we are going to gain a lot of mileage in the realm of the spirit because we are going to exploit the privilege that we have to be able to stand before God and to... So justification provides access. Please help me tell your neighbor. Justification provides access. Now, because of that word access, I need to show you a scripture. This one is not in the script. I'm just excited. So, um, let me show you a scripture. Are you there with me? i show you Scripture. Uh, the scripture I want to show you is the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I know you've read the scripture many times, but um, the use of the word liberty is consistent with ancient English. And English has since evolved. So once and again, we are enjoined to travel into the linguistic foundation in order for us to get a more robust um, rendering of that verse. That liberty there is actually access. Now, the reason why it begins with now, it means now there means in the resurrection. How many of you have ever 
done anything like agri sorry plant production. You planted something and the thing grew and you ate from what you planted. Okay, so we have a few people here. So how many of you have never planted anything? Everything you have been eating is what other people plant. Okay. Try planting something. Huh? So when you take corn in your hands and you cast it into the ground, the corn might be white, the corn might be yellow. But when it comes into the ground and it stays in the ground, it absorbs the moisture of the earth and, and soil mineral um, matter and soil water. Uh, what it does is that it affects the, the outer shell of the seed and then it releases the, vi the, the vital force. And so you will see germination will take place. When a plant germinates from the ground, you will notice that it is not the same as the seed that was casted into the ground. The corn was yellow, but when it grew, it was green. It didn't look like what you casted down. The same thing that happened to Jesus. Jesus was buried, but in resurrection, he now manifests as the life-giving spirit. So the noun there means in resurrection. The Lord Jesus that you used to know is now that spirit. Exactly. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is access. So part of this access is made possible because of our justification. Now we can stand before God. There's no quarrel between me and God anymore. And this new blessing that we have available to us is on the basis of our justification. So the peace that is spoken about in this context is a judicial kind of peace that has settled the discord I had with God. So now I can access God. Now I can do business with God. Now I can pray. Now I can come into God's presence. Now I can stand and knock. I can stand and ask. I can stand and seek. And I have the opportunity to exploit the potential and the power of prayer just because an altar was set up that guaranteed my justification. So that's the first kind of peace. I want to show you the second kind of peace. The second kind of peace is in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. This second kind of peace is critical to your priesthood. It's very critical to your engagement of God. This second kind of peace is experiential. Are you there in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning from verse 11? Ephesians chapter 2, beginning from verse 11. He said, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, Ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Can you see? Blood. Anytime you see atonement, are you there? Anytime you see the blood, just think altar. Because altar is synonymous with sacrifice. Anytime you see blood. So when you go back to your Bible this evening, take your electronic Bible and run a search. All the times you, you see blood in the New Testament, every such time, what is drawing your attention to is an altar. I'm going to show you the characteristics of altars, various definitions of altars, and one of them is that it's a place of atonement. So anytime you see the blood, it is referring to an altar. In fact, the way God designed human life is that human life will be supported, reinforced, and powered by altars. And just in case you have no altar, you are naked. 
I remember when Rabiu, how many of you know Rabiu? Okay, when Rabiu gave his life to Christ, and uh, hallelujah. I did not take permission from Rabbi to say this, so I, w- I will not say it. So let me say the one that I wanted to say initially. When he gave his life to Christ, his mother called him because he was from a staunch Muslim family, and he was being raised to become an imam. Rabbi was exceptionally intelligent, so they had noticed his intelligence, and they felt that the best use that this intelligence could be put to was to make him an imam. And it was still the intelligence that gave him the (laughs) not inquisitive mind that uh, did not allow him to settle on the family vision. (laughs) Hallelujah. So he gave his life to Christ. And then when he gave his life to Christ, ah, well, his surname is Madaki, Madaki. That's not a name, it's a title. That's his grandfather's title. Because the grandfather was the chieftain of altars in the territory. In fact, oh my God. So, so altars, charms, and all of that were part of their civilization. So when he gave his life to Christ, he wanted to have nothing to do with charms and all that stuff. So his mother called him one day and said, you'll be moving around with an empty stomach. <laughs> that nobody lives life as a man with an empty stomach. What she meant by that idiomatic expression is that you need charms to arm yourself, that life is supernatural, and the only way to administer life is to have supernatural support and reinforcement. She was wrong. She was wrong because Rabbi was not without spiritual support. We had taught him the way of altars. And when all the beasts of his family came against him, it was proven that the altars that he surfaced were stronger than the altars of the Madaki family. As you see here. Now the way God designed it is that the life of a man will be reinforced, will be supported, will be powered by altars. Life is spiritual. And what the mom said to him was suggestive of the fact that you cannot fulfill natural life without spiritual support. Some of our ancestors discovered the same thing. They found out that man was frail. Man was insufficient. Man was incapable. Man was limited. So they needed something to give this frail, easily vaporized human life some form of certainty. And that's why they made covenant with Aleku and with Swem. And the other day, I was telling somebody that Aleku has no power. And then the person, you know, the person said, when you say short, such things, you whisper it. Don't, <laughs> don't say it loud. What, what are you saying? You say, what? In this land, they don't make such statements. We can't repeat it after you because we are idoma. He's a victim. 16 years later, I saw him in Abuja. He was still a victim. We can change our fortunes this month so that the outcome of our interactions with the realm of the spirit will produce fruit that our family members will know that we have gone beyond the limits that have been placed by the family altars in the name of Jesus Christ. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 14 is my emphasis. For he is our peace. This is organic peace. The first one is judicial peace. This one I'm speaking about here is organic peace. Please. Just label it and keep it. Because when we start the practicalities of altars, you are going to be able to measure 
your level of compliance with spiritual demands based on this organic peace. So don't forget the Bible says that the chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. There was a payment that was made in order for us to have both judicial peace and organic peace. When I say organic peace, I'm talking about peace that is a function of the life of God that is operational in your spirit. If you are in alignment with God, that peace will be boosted. If you are in dislocation with God, that peace, the, you will feel an infraction in that peace. And if for any reason you feel an infraction in that peace, it means you are not safe. That's one of the reasons that points that you are in a state of emergency. And when you are in a state of emergency, you will break your routine to attend to the emergency at hand. Is that not so? Okay. So we are going to, as we study on priesthood, we are going to highlight circumstances that suggest that you are in a state of emergency. But we have not reached there. We have not reached there. We are still trying to do uh, the broad strokes before we go to the specific strokes. And the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. So this is, this, you know, I told you that the Old Testament points to the New Testament. It is a shadow of good things to come. It's a shadow of better things. So the Old Testament is prophetic. And if you have the eyes, blessed eyes, you can actually see the New Testament hidden in the Old Testament because the Old Testament is prophetic in itself. You still call it Old Testament if you don't have the eyes to see the New Testament in it. If you have the eyes to see the New Testament in it, it is just one. It's just that the Old Testament is prophetic and it is pointing to good things to come. But if you have the eyes, it is one. Are you there? I said, are you there? You know, the, uh, some guys came up with a theological position and they said, you know, the New Testament began when the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. So it means Jesus was not a New Testament preacher. Jesus was actually an Old Testament preacher. So we should not, we should not uh, rely on the words of Jesus because it is within the scope of a regime that is not as recent as what we have in the uh, New Testament. That, I, I, if there were, was a police among preachers, such, such people should be, should be arrested and quarantined. You know, there's a kind of injection they give cows. Have you? I, <laughs> the Lord will help us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you realize that Jesus forgave people's sins before the cross? Or you don't know that? You think the Bible is a mathematical book? It has its own logic. And except the Holy Spirit opens your eyes, you'll come out a heretic. That's why there were, there were, there were places where they burned people those days. When you start going the way of error, it means there's a spirit whispering to you. It, we know something is talking to you. And if we can prove from the Bible that it's not the Holy Ghost, they'll they put you there and just, this. they touch it. That your kind should not dwell in the Christian community. Error was like a plague that could bend the minds of men and they dealt with it decisively. Today we play with falsehood. We advertise it. We drink it. We celebrate it. And we defend it. Guess what? It's too late. Because the Puritans are coming. The Puritans will not keep quiet. There's a movement that has begun to recover Christianity from charlatans. I moved to talk, but no, I moved. I moved. <laughs> hey! The God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jesus. It was by these same words that they were admonished. They became pillars in the earth that God could put his foot upon to establish his purposes in the earth. God cut covenant with humankind as as unreliable as we are. It was the word of God that was upon their heart. It became their creed. They lived it out. So by the time you go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews says 
that it is by this same faith that the elders obtained a good report. The presbyteros obtained a good maturerio. The word maturerio, that's where ma mataya comes from. It means that the work of God upon their heart was so deep, their convictions were so deep, the only way you can take them away from their con con convictions was that you kill them. As long as they live, this is who they are. And you could not separate them from their convictions. They came before kings and said, we are not afraid to respond to you in this matter. We and our faith are one. It takes a radical to be a revivalist. When people are used to compromise, then he releases the spirit of Elijah. A spirit that is not compatible with compromise, not compatible with any departure from the line of truth. Oh my God, he stands his ground even though he's one man. He brought a nation back to her knees. God has no restraint either to win with many or to conquer with few. We will not deny Jesus. We will not see black and call it white. Even if we will gain financially from it. Our mouth is not bought. We came to be a testimony of his resurrection. Sorry, I just troubled you with my own personal. <laughs> it was my calling that was speaking. It was that thing speaking. It's my calling. It confronts compromise with, 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 with passion. The passion. Oh, some people thought that, okay, if they're treating us with death, you are, you, are, you are mistaken. There is a depth of intercourse you can have with Jesus that you, don't, you are not afraid of death. If, it, if the bullet should bring me down, it means that God counted me worthy to pay the ultimate sacrifice. And men more vicious, men more strong, men more vocal than myself will rise from that seed. Oh, I have seen the glory of God. Sorry, I can no longer do this Bible study. I have seen the glory of God. I have seen the glory of Jesus. There's nothing as bright as it. There's nothing as powerful as it. There's nothing in this world to be compared to it. I will live gazing on that glory. And I will die to possess it. There's a new breed without greed. A radical opposition against unrighteousness. Men that fear God, men that hate sin, men that will preach, pray, and prophesy until revival comes. It's not time to quit. It's time to refire. God is about to prepare the voice of the Nazarite. A new dispensation is coming into the earth. We bear witness of his glory. We bear witness of his power. We dance to the beat of his throne and we pledge our allegiance to his flag. Somebody cry, you shall be his messenger. You shall be his voice in the air.
Ika selima, ake bronde makadia. Isa sa, ika mabaya hata. Oh my God. Heli asi, heli abaka baya. Eskobe makata. A little one will become a thousand. A small one will become a strong nation. Though thy beginning be small, thy later end is a greatly increased. The Lord will make you plenteous in all things. Your testimony will come to pass. And what shall I not say? For time will fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David also and of Samuel and of the prophets who through faith 
subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and out of weakness, were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Hey! Out of weakness, they were made strong. Out of weakness, they were made strong. Oh my God, make us strong. Make us strong. Strong in our conviction. Strong in our testimony. Strong in our weakness. Out of weakness. These are the days of the strong. The strong. Men that will not bend. Men that will not falter. Hey, the strong. The was valiant in fight. They turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Hey. Yata kobe masika, eleke kobosa, ebraska takondela, braita komena hawa. We will not fail him. We will not run from battles. He will march with us. Hey. Roman Aila. Seko Meme. Seko Babulatwa. Seko Sila Hante. Seko Bondela. Seko Bila. Shama Kante Baboria. Sebria Kaskope La Katua. Panta Komo. Panta Shebabola. Ikobosi. Ramena Kudia. Who says sailor? Kobo Bosika, Ella Baskebo, Ebria Kabo Boseke. Our lives will prove that he's not dead. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Even while we prayed, I could hear that sound coming from heaven. It's a sound of judgment. I could hear it. Oh, oh, we stand on your side, we stand with you. Oh, we stand on your word. We stand on your counsel. You mark Benway State as a landing port for revival. The sons of the land desire what you want to do. Oh my God. Come with your flood. Come with your flame. Come with your fire. Light in the altar of our hearts. Sikoba muna kelida. Enso kumbi la suke baba. Brasa te boko prehele kadi. Sabri akante kole. Amai kumpabwa. Isa mena kundi. Akai keke la. Rama suka baba baba tanya. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Be that man that will make up the hedge for your family. Be 
Be that man that will make up the head for your territory. Let God have a ground in your life to stand. Let your life legitimize his intervention in the earth. Just like Abraham gave him a pathway to begin to restructure humankind. Give him an opportunity. He wants to stand on you. Your priesthood will make him stand on you. Oh, the days are upon us. The days are upon us. The days are upon us already. The days are upon us. The days are upon us. The days are upon us. In this breath, can you cry for Nigeria? And say, oh Nigeria, you will not fall to darkness. Oh Nigeria, you will not fall to the machinations of the spirit of the bond woman. Oh Nigeria, oh Nigeria, oh Nigeria. You will not fall. You will not become a victim. There is a prophecy in you. God uttered his words in you. No, darkness will not take over. Darkness will not take over. Someone cry. Come over. Shed in the casket of Robin Asi. He says, Rabba Bakote Baba, Roka Sama, Baba Bakala, Esopa Belai, Iska Brande Kora, Mama 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 Soria, Raka Seta Pe, Raka Banda Babola Kam. I beheld in the spirit and I saw the sword of the Lord descend from heaven. Now in a moment of time that sword will e execute a certain judgment in the life of someone here. Your cry has reached heaven. Your cry has reached. So the Lord sends judgment. Your cry has reached. Your cry, it reached heaven. It reached heaven. It reached into the heavens. So he sent a sword, the sword of judgment, to execute his judgment over your life. Father, let this year not waste. Oh my. Let it be a significant entry point for everyone here, those participating online. Oh my God, let it be an entry point. Let it be an entry point. Let it be an entry point in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. You will share your testimony. 